So in this video, I want to talk some more about existence proofs uh, because we previously uh, have shown how do you prove an existential statement like there exists some x inside of x such that p of, p of x holds, right? And how do you do that? You just provide an example. That's all you have to do. You have to. That's how you have to provide. Uh, how you how you prove it? You just provide an example. Now. When you when you prove an uh, an existential statement like this, you provide an example, um, assuming it's a constructive proof, right? If, if it's a non-constructive proof, you know it exists, but you don't even know what it is. That is a possibility here, of course. But you provide an example, you prove it exists. This tells you that there's at least one one object that satisfies the conditions, but how many are there total? And honestly, that question is getting much more into the combinatorics that we've explored earlier. Um, combinatorics is very much interested in existential questions. Honestly, like the whole goal of combinatorics is basically threefold, right? Every combinatorial problem has three phases. The first phase is going to be existence. Does this combinatorial object that I'm interested in, does it even exist or not? Uh, and then if you prove existence, it's similar to what we did before, although it could be a lot harder. The next step is going to be classification. We want to classify our objects. Can we organize them in a meaningful way, in a helpful way? And that's about putting things into categories. Oftentimes, it's about describing a partition on the objects we are interested in. And then lastly, once it's classified, we then want to count it. We want to enumerate them. Um, can we list all of them in order so that from these organized families, we can count each of the families and, and put it all together? This is the goal of all of these combinatorial problems. We want to count them. Being able to count every possibility truly shows that we understand completely the object that we are interested in. And so while we spent some earlier examples on counting, uh, and when our combinatorial unit, sometimes that's too hard. Sometimes you need the you need the simpler question of classifying because if you can't organize them, uh, then you can't count them. Um, and then sometimes even before classification, you have to even know if they exist or not. So existence is the fundamental combinatorial question which we are exploring right now. Um, but in this video, what I want to do is provide a very very uh, simple combinatorial exercise. That is to say. Um, with existence often comes a statement about uniqueness because maybe when it comes to counting them there is only one you know kind of like the highlander there there can only be one i mean there 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 we have existence we know that one exists but is there a second one sometimes the answer is no there isn't a second one and this then leads to this idea of uniqueness there exists only one um, now, when you want to prove that there is something well, that something's unique, that there's only one of them, there's really two parts to an, to that proof. There, the first part is going to be your existence proof that we've done previously. So you prove existence, and you're going to show that there is um, greater than one such object that satisfies the condition. Now, for uniqueness, there's a second part. You prove existence first. The second part is then often referred to as this uniqueness part. You have to show that there is not more than one of these things. So the idea is if the number of objects is greater than or equal to one and less than or equal to one, when you put those together, you have exactly one object and hence it is unique. Um, for, so for existence, we show there's at least one. For uniqueness, we show there is at most one. Um, let's revisit a proof that we had seen previously. There exists a unique even prime number, okay? So the word unique here suggests there's two parts. We have to prove that it exists, and we have to prove that it's unique. We've already proven it exists, that, that, that an even prime exists. We did that in the previous lesson, but it's such an easy argument. Just for the sake of completeness, I'm just going to include it again, okay? How do we know there exists an even prime number? Well, two is an even prime number. Two is even, and it is prime. It's only divisors of one and two. So this is a very simple argument. This gives us the uniqueness part. We now know that a even prime exists. Now we have to prove that there's not a second even prime number. So consider generally Q to be an even prime number. Because it's even, that means two divides Q. But wait a second, Q is a prime number. It's only divisors are gonna be one and Q. One is not two. And two does divide Q, so the two, which is a divisor, has to equal Q. So we've now shown that every prime number that's even is equal to two. So there isn't a second one. 
every uniqueness proof has the two parts the existence parts which shows we have at least one and we so that this right here shows there's at least at least um one even prime and then the uniqueness part shows there's at most one even prime number okay now previously in our lecture series we had used um, the well ordering principle to show examples of uniqueness um, we've, I mentioned these before. I'm not going to go into much too much detail about it right now. But those arguments um, were, in fact, uniqueness arguments. When we did the division algorithm, when we did the Euclidean algorithm, when we proved these things, we showed that certain numbers existed by the well num the well ordering principle. Particularly, we got a minimum element, and then we argued and got a contradiction, thus giving us uniqueness. Uh, usually contradicting the minimality of that element that the well-ordering principle gave us. So a general strategy to prove uniqueness is that you first prove existence, and then by way of contradiction, you suppose there is a second one, and then you drive a contradiction. Because um, if there's a, if you get a contradiction with at least two, that means you have a most one and you give uniqueness. Um, to demonstrate this technique, where to prove uniqueness, we will suppose for the sake of contradiction that there are at least two. Um, I actually want to use a calculus example. So going back to calculus one, um, there was two theorems that you probably saw in your calculus course. Um, I will remind you what those statements are. Uh, we have the intermediate value theorem and the mean value theorem. The intermediate value theorem we're going to list here first. The intermediate value theorem tells us that if f is a continuous function on the closed interval a to b, um, let's let's unwrap that for a little bit. Closed intervals, we're familiar with that. So this is going to be some interval along the x-axis for which the bounds a and b are included in that. Um, f is a function um, in the calculus sense, of course, and then continuous. Continuous, we could be precise about the definition, but for the sake of this example, continuous means that we can draw the graph without picking up our pencil. Okay, uh, that, that's what continuous is. So if f is continuous on the closed interval a to b, and if n is any value between f of a and f of b, so let's see on our graph, f of a is this y-coordinate here, and f of b is this y-coordinate right here, and n is just something in the middle, hence intermediate value. Value typically means a y-coordinate, intermediate means it's between, so we have a y-coordinate that lives between the y-coordinates of two established points on the graph. Um, and we also need to assume that f of a doesn't equal f of b, because if f of a equals f of b, there is no intermediate values, okay? Um, the intermediate value theorem then tells us if we have a continuous function with these properties, then there exists some number c on the open interval a to b, so it's not a and it's not b, that obtains that y-coordinate. You get some x-coordinate c, like you see here in my diagram, that then obtains the intermediate value, all right? Now... We're not going to prove the intermediate value theorem. That's a proof that belongs to a, a analysis class, real analysis class. Um, I'm just going to use it as gospel for the sake of this. But I do want to make mention that the intermediate value theorem is an existential statement. If certain conditions satisfied, then there exists a number that lives between these two that satisfies the property. Be aware that the intermediate value theorem is a non-constructive existential statement. It doesn't tell you what what the number is. It just tells you generally where it lives. It's going to be somewhere between A and B. We know it exists, but that's all. So this is going to be one of these ex, uh, non-constructive existential statements. Okay, these happen all the time in mathematics. We're going to use this one in just a moment. Um, the, the main story here is what, uh, you know, if you hit this line and you hit this line, you hit every line in between, right? You can't, the only way you can get from only way you can get from here to here is you have to cross the line. There's no way to get past it unless you have like a wormhole which you teleport past it. But if you have a wormhole, you're not continuous. The only way to continuously go from, from below to above is to cross this line in the middle. That's the intermediate value theorem. Um, another important theorem from calculus is the mean value theorem. Let me remind you what that one tells us. So now we have a function f again. Um, it has slightly different uh, assumptions this time. We do require that f is continuous on the closed interval a to b. Um, again, same meaning of, of continuity that we had before. We also require that f is differentiable 
on the open interval A to B. So it doesn't have to be differentiable at the endpoints A and B. It does have to be continuous there, um, but it'll be differentiable between everywhere between. Um, differentiable means that the derivative exists everywhere between A and B, or in other words, the tangent line exists everywhere between A and B, or you can think of it as it's a smooth graph. There's no sharp corners or vertical tangent lines or anything like that, because the derivative, the tangent line exists between all points A and B, okay? Um, so with these assumptions, uh, there exists some C such that C lives between A and B. So just like before, C is on the open interval A to B. And C satisfies the following relationship, that the derivative of F evaluated at C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. What you want to, what, what, how you want to interpret this is, is that with these conditions satisfied, um, which l let me mention, of course, that um, if your function is differentiable, it's continuous. So um, honestly, this first condition just saying that it has to be continuous on the endpoints and differentiable everywhere else. Anyways, um, what this statement is telling us geometrically is that the tangent line is somewhere parallel to the um, the secant line. That is, if you take the average rate of change, which is illustrated right here, it's the secant line that connects the start and end. Um, by the mean value theorem, there will exist a tangent line that is parallel to this secant line, right? So, like so. Or in other words, that somewhere the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change, which is why it's called the mean value theorem. It's not like it's a nice, it's not mean as opposed to the nice value theorem. It's, it's an average value theorem. Uh, that the average rate of change is somewhere equal to the instantaneous rate of change. The secant line is parallel to a tangent line. But I want you to be aware that, again, the mean value theorem is a non-constructive existential statement. It's a conditional statement. If these things hold, then there exists a number C that has this property. It doesn't tell you anything about C that other than it exists, and it does give you an interval. But as there are literally infinitely many numbers between A and B here, that interval still doesn't narrow it down very much. But it does give you that that thing exists. Um, and so these are both existential statements. Um, well, I should say conditional exponential statements. If hypotheses hold, then we're guaranteed the existence of these elements. And we're going to use this to prove a very nice result. Um, we can actually prove um, that the equation x cubed plus x minus 1 equals 0 has exactly one real root. And honestly, I should just, I should scratch this off, right? We don't, the statement is the equation x cubed plus x minus 1 equals 0 has exactly one real root. That equation has one solution. OK, that's a uniqueness statement to say that it has exactly one means that there is at least one and there is at most one. This is a uniqueness statement. So in order to prove this, we're going to first prove existence. We want to prove there's at least one. So we will first prove that the equation has a solution. Now, the, we're going to use the intermediate value theorem to accomplish that. And the intermediate value theorem and the mean value theorem are about functions. So we have to turn this equation into a statement about functions. Well, it's pretty nice since the right-hand side is just 0 here. So I'm going to take the function f of x to be x cubed plus x minus 1. And notice any solution to this equation is just an x-intercept of this function. Okay. Uh, so take f of x to be that polynomial function. I want to mention that because it's a polynomial function, it's continuous. This is a property of calculus that I won't justify any more than citing by calculus. Now notice, with this function, if you take the limit as x approaches infinity, f of x will likewise approach infinity. Um, and so that tells us that if, if f of x is going towards infinity, there has to be a point, some point x equals 0, that the y-coordinate becomes positive. Okay, now again, right here, this is a non-constructive existential statement. I'm saying that there's somewhere a point where if you're going off towards infinity, then your graph somewhere has to be above the x-axis. You can't go towards infinity if you're not above the x-axis eventually. So there's going to be some point where you're above the x-axis. That's a non-constructive argument. But let's also provide a constructive argument. You don't need both, but for the, for the point of demonstration, you could also take the point... Take f of 1 here. f of 1 will be 1 plus 1 minus 1, which is 1. That's positive. So this tells us that somewhere the function is positive. And specifically, I know now at f at um, f of 1, the function is positive. Okay, so it'll be above the x-axis. By a similar argument, um, if you take the limit 
as x approaches negative infinity, f of x will approach negative infinity as well. And so it's pointing down on the left-hand side of its graph, which again, if you approach negative infinity, there has to be some point where you're eventually below the x-axis and hence your y-coordinate is negative. Um, that's a non-constructive argument, but I can make it into a constructive argument by finding a specific point. Oh, take f of zero here. f of zero equals zero plus zero minus one, which is negative one, which is negative. So this tells us that um, the point f zero comma, sorry, zero comma f zero would be below the x-axis, all right? We have a continuous function, which is somewhere negative, somewhere positive. If you take the intermediate value of zero, this tells you by the intermediate value theorem that there's somewhere that the function has to cross the x-axis. We're gonna call that point r, r for root. And so we see that this polynomial equation does have a solution. The intermediate value theorem gives us existence. And, e, and we, we know the number r lives somewhere between zero and one. You have x equals zero, and you have x equals one right here but we don't have anything better than that. We know it exists somewhere there. So despite my efforts to um, give constructive examples of where it's positive and negative, in the end, I get a non-constructed value here that exists. So honestly, you could have gotten away with these ones as well. Um, this is true in general. If you have a polynomial of odd degree, it points up on the right and it points down on the bottom, on the left, it's gonna eventually cross the x-axis. Every polynomial of odd degree has an x-intercept by this same argument. Um, it's non-constructive, but every polynomial, every real polynomial of odd degree has a real root. It's a consequence of the intermediate value theorem. So now that we know that a root exists, let us argue that it is unique. In order to prove that R is a unique solution to the equation, let us suppose there's at least two distinct solutions. Let's call them A and B. And since they're distinct, I can assume that A is less, uh, less than B for the considerations here, okay? Now, because A is a solution to the equation, that means it's an x-intercept to my function f, so f of A equals zero. But since B is also a solution to the equation, it's likewise an x-intercept to my function, and so f of B is likewise equal to zero. Okay, so um, let's re then recall that we're talking about a polynomial here. Um, this polynomial x cubed plus x minus one, I might want to write down the screen, we're going to need this in a second, but f of x equals x cubed plus x minus one. Um, it's a polynomial, so it's going to be continuous for all real numbers, it's going to be differentiable for all real numbers. Again, this is a, this is a, these are conditions that you can demonstrate in a calculus setting. Um, all that I care about is that the, the assumptions of the mean value theorem are satisfied, therefore, there exists some number c that sits in between a and b, such that the derivative of f at c is equal to zero. But on the other hand, if this is my function, I can calculate the derivative by the usual rules. The power rule gives me three x squared plus one. That's this function right here. Notice though that x squared is always greater than or equal to zero for any real number. If I times that by three, that is still true. If I add one to both sides, you're gonna get three x squared plus one is greater than or equal to one, which means it is strictly greater than zero. Um, three x squared plus one is always positive it's always positive so the derivative is always positive but the mean value theorem tells me that the derivative is somewhere equal to zero that is a contradiction and we got a contradiction which means our assumption was bad we do not have two x-intercepts to the function thus we don't have two solutions to the equation which means the one i found earlier was the unique solution and so this then is a nice example from calculus that demonstrates how you prove something is unique. You prove that it exists and you prove that a second one does not exist. Oftentimes you do that by proof by contradiction as we did in this example.